All right, here we go. We got chapter six, the London opening. And we have a London expert and recovering London addict, Jesse here. How are you doing, Jesse? I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, so one of my favorite posts I ever wrote for chess goals was why I dropped the London system. And so I'm going to get some PTSD, I think, from looking at London uh, theory. Um, but I'm ready to do it. So uh, we all know how the London starts. So either knight f3 or bishop f4, these moves are interchangeable. So we're going to uh, do the same thing. Um, the one wrinkle that I want to, uh, that we should go over is against the London, we're recommending e6 first instead of c6 that we're seeing in a lot. And that's going to be a key idea in a lot of these lines. So e6, now we get a standard London system and bishop d6. So already um, offering a bishop trade, um, there's a lot to unpack here. So we have five different moves we're going to look at here in this position, which is just kind of crazy. <laughs> and um, let's start with bishop g3. I think this is about what we'll see about half the time, very thematic London move wanting to capture towards the center. Um, so let's go over how we're going to uh, put our little chess goals wrinkle against bishop g3. So our idea here is queen to e7, and this is a line that I found based on the Lee Chess database. Um, it was scoring pretty well, and I was playing around with a bunch of different ideas. Like, what could we do against a London player that's just not in their standard London repertoire? I wanted to find something a little bit different. And queen e7 has this nice, I call it a trap in the course, but it just depends. Like, it's not always a, you know a winning move or something, but we're going to look for bishop takes g3. And after white takes back, queen to b4, checking the king and hitting the b-pawn. So it's just kind of this cool little idea that makes white think a bit and hopefully takes them out of the standard London moves. Um, but now that I mentioned that, let's try to start with what looks to be kind of the standard London move, pawn to e3. Um, so after e3, we're going to take, take back, queen to b4, check. Now at this point, there's two natural moves. Uh, knight b to d2 and knight to c3. We'll look at both of those, but knight b to d2 is by far the most common. So what are we going to do after this? And yeah, so after knight b2, we are going to, of course, take our pawn. <laughs> kind of the whole idea behind this operation. And uh, like Matt said, it's not like we're winning here or anything, but this is not what you want to see as a London player. London players are boring, uh, middle-aged accountants, and they just want to get a position, play normal chess. They don't want to sack a pawn, try to get the rook involved. Um, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. But uh, London players do just want a nor nice normal setup. When they see this prep, I think we're already winning the psychological battle. <laughs> um, so let's take our free pawn. Um, Bishop d3, nice developing move, getting ready to castle. And we need to get our queen to safety quickly. So queen a3, making a lot of room backwards. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say about these last few moves, Matt? No, essentially. So what we want to do is grab the pawn and then get the queen back to safety. Um, and in these kind of positions, like we're not necessarily getting the initiative because when we take the pawn, white gets a lot of development in. Um, but what we're doing is we're playing for the material advantage in terms of the imbalances. And if we can hold the material, that can allow us to play for the win. And if white tries to get the material back, that's when we look to play for the initiative. So we're gonna look at two lines here. We're gonna look at castling for white and rook takes h7, trying to win that pawn back immediately. So let's start with castling. Um, we're gonna recommend knight to f6. And after knight to e5, White is playing actively, but they do have to be careful about having too many trades on the board. So if we start trading everything off and we're just up a pawn in the end game, we're gonna have a big advantage and we're gonna be playing for the win. So knight e5 looks aggressive, right? White wants to play aggressive, they're down a pawn, but this is actually a small mistake because it's allowing us to start offering trades. Knight b to d7. Yep. And uh, we are happy with trades here because we have the extra pawn. So if we take everything off the board, um, we should be winning with the extra pawn. So after um, we uh, offer the knight trade, 
white probably doesn't want to go back or defend and kind of get into the same situation. So they're going to play aggressive with the move f4, so looking to kind of clamp down on the e5 square. Here, we shouldn't really give them this advantage. Uh, if we take, they're going to take back with very likely the f-pawn. Their rook comes alive, our knight needs to move, so there's no reason to allow all this. We're instead going to undermine the center with c5. So if they take here, we could we could always take back, or we could take here and damage their pawn structure. So c5 is a really nice pawn brick to get in uh, very at this exact moment. So that's a really nice move to kind of destabilize the position even more. Yeah, and I, I put in the notes here, um, white is the one that might be wanting a queen trade soon if they're not careful, because these dark squares are all vulnerable for white if we're able to chip away at their pawn structure. That's what we're doing with c5. Like we have ideas of h5 even, bringing the rook into the attack, or trading here and playing a move like queen c3, targeting this weak pawn. So we're very quickly coming at the dark pawns. Um, so now the best move is actually queen c1. We're going to take, they take, king e7, and at this point I'm claiming that white doesn't have really any compensation for the pawn. And I think our plan is going to be pawn to c4, knight to e8, and then f6, kicking this knight out. And then let's try to convert this pawn up endgame. So what I'm hoping is when you get the London and you're able to win that b2 pawn with this little trap, that you're able to get this type of position where you say, okay, I'm going to grab the pawn, get the queen back to safety, that I'm not going to play super passive, but I'm just going to look for trades. And if white gives me anything, I will take it, right? If they give me a chance to play active chance to play for the initiative, I'm going for it. You know, we're not just going to sit back and hold that pawn forever. We're going to look to play dynamically and use that pawn to our advantage. Yep, and white's pawn structure looks very ugly here. Um, some overextended pawns, some backwards pawns, doubles pawns, and we have pretty much no weaknesses in our camp. So we have the extra pawn and uh, really playing for the win here. Um, so yeah, nice, uh, nice transition into the end game. Yeah, so now let's look at white trying to get this pawn back right away. Rook takes h7. Um, and I put in the notes here, this move almost always gives white's compensation away. Uh, so what we can do now is trade down and go right into this endgame. Rook takes h7, bishop takes h7, knight f6, hitting this bishop with a tempo. And after the bishop comes back, now we're going to again play c5, kind of going after these dark squares, right? We see there's no dark square bishop for either side. But if we can chip away at that d-pawn, bring the knight out, maybe attack it with the queen, that's going to give us a bit of play. Um, and actually here I mentioned knight b to d7 might even be our, our recommended move. So if takes, we can take back with the knight. And yeah, white's uh, already down a little bit according to the engine. And if white doesn't capture on c5, what are we going to do? Uh, so if white doesn't capture on c5, um, we can just push on with c4 and really play connect four, get all these uh, pawns rolling, and yep, just keep pushing our uh, queen side pawns. Yeah, and a, a nice imbalance to note here is we have an extra queen side pawn and white's extra pawn is doubled. So yeah, if we get c4 in and then start pushing b and a, we could create a passer over here and play connect four. <laughs> I had one question here. Uh, okay, never mind. I was going to ask why we can't lock the bishop in, but we just drop a piece. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Usually, that's such a thematic move. That was kind of crossed my mind, too. I was like, oh, are we going to try to trap it? But then, yeah, the knight's yeah. attacked right away. I would just blitz that out, no problem. <laughs> it's probably playable. <laughs> Even material, but... Dropped a pawn, though. Yeah, okay. let's not do that. Let's not do that. <laughs> okay. okay, so back to move seven. Erase it, erase it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, we have knight to... B to D2 is by far the most popular, but let's look at knight C3. This is a common way in the London to give up the B pawn, play knight C3 and get active with that knight. So again, we're going to play queen takes B2. It's the only way to play for the advantage once we commit to the check. Um, and now after knight to B5, white is threatening knight takes C7 check with the fork, and they're threatening A3 followed by rook to B1, trapping the queen. So what are we going to do here? Yep, so we have precisely one move to not lose the game immediately, and that is queen b4 check. So um, pretty pretty th like easy move to find once you realize that white is threatening here 
and a trap or a queen. So we'll check um, after c3 or uh, blocking with a knight or something. Um, we have the same idea, queen a5, just defending this square here. Now we want to play a6 because the knight guards c3. Oh, there you go. Doesn't have a lot of good squares. So the most popular move, queen to b3, is actually a big mistake. After a6, knight a3, again, we're going with this move c5. So we don't have a dark bishop, but keep this theme in mind. c5 is a really nice move to not only try to trade on d4 sometimes, but also look to play c4 and then get the b pawn pushed up the board. Um, and again, we're up a pawn, so remember that there's no b pawn for white. So where's the compensation for white? They need to prove that they have something for that pawn. Yep, I think this uh, this line goes a couple more moves. So they take the pawn, d takes, and instead of capturing back right away, we'll play it nice and patient. We really want to capture back here with the knight, hit the queen, and bring our knight into the game. Capturing here with the queen, it's fine, but it doesn't really like really develop our position or uh, improve our pieces in any way. In, um, if white plays queen b4, we will take with the queen because we have to in that case pretty much. Yeah. Um, and then one thing I just wanted to note was like in all of these lines, we're looking to take b2, bring the queen back to safety, um, and then oftentimes play c5. So kind of keep that in mind. In all these lines, that's the strategy. And in this particular position, this is how we're going to get the minor pieces out. Castle king side, and we're still off the pawn. Yep, I like that uh, at the end of these lines, we're always up a pawn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll take it, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's the London. It's one of the most solid openings for white, so we're trying to spice it up a bit. For sure. It's like squeezing blood from an onion. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Red onion? <laughs> it's getting late. Um, so we'll go to 5, knight b to d2 next. If they play this move, they are most likely aware of this idea of trading bishops and queen to b4 check. But now, this is something that I really like about this whole chapter, we're going to actually play for pawn to e5. So it's not like this was a wasted idea if white blocks the check. These pieces are also preparing e5. And typically in the London, so you were a London player yourself for quite a while, Jesse, typically you see c5 probably, what, 95% of the time if, if uh, a pawn's going to attack d4, it's c5, right? Yeah. How often do you see e5? Um, you don't see it that often, and when you see it, you always assume you, you messed up big time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's what we're going for here. Um, knight d7. Now, I'll let you guys in on a little secret. This is full disclosure. It's in the notes. In this position, white can claim an advantage if they know to play bishop to h4, followed by a quick e4. So if you think your opponent is prepared specifically for you, they know you play this course or this exact line, you may want to switch it up slightly here, right? You have an equal position anyways if you don't do this. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. But we're going to just push ahead because the odds of someone playing that are very low. So we're going to go right away for this e5 break. Yeah, so don't tell anybody. Uh, knight, <laughs> knight d7. Um, so if we look at the stats here, I guess I don't have many games... I see this... 92 games for club players. None of them play bishop h4. Zero out of 92. I'm looking at uh, all classical games, and I have I see one game with e with e4. Oh, e4 right away, not bishop h4. No, and e4 okay. is not that good of a move. Yeah. So it's yeah, no one's going <laughs> to see it unless they see this video. <laughs> That'll be our London for white repertoire. We'll have like one line. <laughs> what to do against a chess goals player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So we are going to look at the most common move that everyone's going to play, e3. This is just such a London move. Ugh, just such a London move. They're going to play e3. Um, okay. I'll, I'll get off my London high horse. So, <laughs> oops, I got ahead. So we are going to now play e5. I also like, uh, I was going to mention this a couple moves back, that we played... Uh, knight d7 to allow our c pawn some mobility in the future too um, but here we're going e5 so we have this pawn plenty defended um, play could continue with white taking the pawn we're going to first take back with the knight 
And we're probably just going to look at some trades on the e5 square. And now I feel like we're playing the white side of this position. If you look at the d5 pawn versus the e3 pawn, we got just a little bit more space. And all of our minor pieces are getting out very comfortably. Uh, so here the most common move is c3. And after this, uh, since white didn't take us on e5, we're going to take, double in the pawns, play knight to f6. And now there's two different ways you can play that. So I'm leaving you with two plans. You could play c6, bishop d7, and castle kingside. Or if you're feeling feisty, you could castle queenside. So both of those plans are perfectly reasonable. Um, and if we look at this stockfish eval here, it's like half a pawn for black, maybe just a little bit less. So nice position, very safe. Yep, so one small uh, benefit of going uh, queen side is that you're kind of castling out of this open file. Um, but the open file really isn't much. H6 is going to kind of solve our problems. And these pawns here are doubled, so it's kind of hard to commit to like a really good pawn storm with doubled pawns. So uh, I think it's mostly just a, a personal preference on what kind of game you're looking for. Yeah, and you can kind of base it on what you think white's going to do too. Or if you know your opponent, maybe they like dry games versus attacking games. Yeah. So you got options there. Fair, fair assumption. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, London flares can be attacking too. Sometimes they like the queenside castle. <laughs> so now let's go to move five, um, just to back up one. We looked at e3, we looked at knight d2. Let's now look at c3. And we should be happy to see this move because we're going to go with our e5 plan, and this is just going to be very passive. So knight d7, after e3, nice move, nice London move, you know, get their little triangle formation. <laughs> we're not that scared. Uh, <laughs> we, with this exact move order, though, we need to wait on the e5 push, because the white queen could be ready to win our d pawn after the trades. Uh, so in this case, we're going to recommend knight to f6, and after knight d2, now we go e5. And one thing to keep in mind, like if a London player puts the bishop on d3 too, uh, too quickly, it kind of creates this extra problem of potentially e4 being played. But yeah, now we get our e5 break in. What, what do you think about this position, Jesse? Yeah, so this is a very similar position to the last line. Um, is there, yeah, it looks like there's like some decent chance it's going to transpose at some point. Um, but what's very likely to happen is, again, this mass trade on e5. So d takes, knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, queen takes. And um, this pawn is well defended. And we kind of, again, it seems like we're almost a tempo up from last move since our knight is, or no, maybe our knight was out last. Yeah, so the difference is in this line, you're right, it could transpose. So in this line, I showed bishop takes e5 for white. Instead okay. of letting us take on g3, otherwise right. it was about to transpose. Okay, yeah. So we have to we have to come up with other lines, otherwise we're just like wasting your time. So of course we want to look at what happens if bishop takes. Um, our queen is really nicely centralized here. White has one tempo move, um, but then we could just pin in the future. We're probably want to move our queen away first. Um, yeah, no, so and that's actually that's actually. <laughs> yeah, we show those up. show those two moves. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, and yeah, now our plan, we can castle queenside, or sorry, castle kingside. Note that uh, white does not have the open file in this line. And so I think we're ready for a, a kind of a dynamic middle game. There's still a lot of play left. We got our pawn break in, and we have a, a nice central pawn. So I think black is maybe slightly better, but uh, not winning or anything. You know, I liked your assessment in the other line about the rook being uh, open on the h-file for white. So in this case, we're very safe to castle kingside, and then c5, reroute this bishop to c6, put a rook on d8, and that's how we're going to kind of just press our space edge a little bit. Um, and like Jesse said, it's it's close to even, but you know, you're probably looking at 0.2 or so edge for black. Just a nice, nice little edge, as if we were playing the white pieces with the extra space. So now we go all the way back to move four. So we looked at bishop to g3 here and like jesse mentioned that's going to be about half of your games uh, so what we're going to look at next is the second most popular move e3 this will be two variations and then we'll look at uh, bishop takes d6 followed by 
knight e5, bishop g5 as the final two uh, variations. So we'll go to e3 now. Interesting choice, allowing us to double the f-pawns. But when the f-pawns get doubled, it gives white a really good hold on this e5 square. Um, but I still think we should take. And what I'm going to show you guys is a strategic way to play against this pawn structure. So bishop takes, e takes, queen to d6. And what are we threatening here, Jesse? <laughs> well, we're uh, threatening our, our favorite move, uh, queen check winning the pawn. Um, so uh, very similar to the last ideas, or I guess uh, the last few lines we were covering. Um, black, or so in this line, we're going to go through what happens if they allow it. So g3, queen before check, knight blocks, and we're going to win it. We're going to take the pawn. No yeah. reason not to. <laughs> and the f pawn was hanging too, so that's why g3 was played because we had right. that dual threat. Um, and now after bishop to d3, we're going to keep it simple queen to a3. Other moves here also work, but there's really no reason to allow. Um, white chances to win our queen. Let's just play queen a3, and then she's now ready to safely escape when needed. After castle, uh, knight to f6, and then we'll leave you with the plan here. We want to castle kingside, um, play our queen back to d6, play c5, like we saw previously, and knight b to d7. So we won the pawn, bring everything back, play our typical c5, and it's on white again. To prove how much compensation do you have for the one pawn and according to stockfish it's maybe about half a pawn that they have in terms of compensation but they have to prove it yep so i think white's main form of compensation is going to be the c5 square very uh, juicy outpost is f6 in the cards in some point in the future in this uh line map i think so yeah so if that knight is planted there and we're having a lot of trouble getting developed i think definitely f6 is in the cards um, and the other imbalance that favors white probably is these two bishops. So what we want to do is try to get this center open. Because the, the quicker we can open up this position, the, the quicker we can kind of prove that we have that advantage with the extra pawn. But also if we're able to get the c4 break again, which is kind of thematic, then we could get the queen side pawns rolling. And remember, our, our queen's going to be tucked away. Yep, another idea that I'll just throw out here is we can try to put the bishop on a6 and trade off our really bad bishop for their, you know, good bishop. So uh, just another thing to consider if, uh, you know, play develops in that way. It's kind of fun, like when, when you're up that pawn and all the trades help you, all the even trades, like you can just really annoy your opponent. Like, oh, here's a queen trade offer. Here's a knight offer. We're going to trade off center pawns and like, you know, create more trades after that happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's just sort of frustrating for the opponent. And that, I'm not afraid of any big attack here by white. Um, so yeah, we should be in pretty good shape. So now, let's see. We just looked at 6 g3. So now we'll go to 6 queen d2. Jesse has a fly in the room. <laughs> yeah, I have a little fruit fly. Okay, I just got him. Um... No flies were harmed in the production of this <laughs> <laughs> One fly was harmed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's the dual threats. Uh, what else could white play here? Uh, yeah, so in order to defend this yeah, this square and this square, uh, the geometry of the board gives us queen d2. And here we're going to break immediately with c5. So grabbing space and uh, just going for uh, the d4 pawn, basically. You know what this reminds me of a little bit? Reminds me of our um, d4 repertoire for white when we face the Slav and we do the early bishop g5. So after this takes takes, you know how we get like a lot of these structures in the exchange Slav? Right. Where it's uh, colors reverse, but that d4 pawn is a huge weakness because it's not defended by any pawns. Yeah. Um, and this is something that we can play against long term. And actually, I just had an o OTB analysis video against Master Thompson where we had a very similar pawn structure to this. He ended up drawing or holding the draw, but I was able to win one of those pawns, and I had some really good winning chances. Yes, that was uh, one of actually one of my favorite videos that you've done. Um, so I'll just give a, a teeny like two minute story. But Matt and uh, Master Thompson are far and away like the two uh, highest rated players in our club that kind of like play regularly, and so their last the last tournament. Matt got the win, and then this tournament, Matt was really trying to get the win because it would have pushed your rating like 
tw- what was it like 2240 or something mm-hmm. and um so like the whole club was kind of just watching this game and after the end of the game actually the club director sent an email to the whole club like please analyze this game everyone wants to see it and so you know matt delivered so it's super fun seeing those uh high level games and i don't think there's a lot of analysis like that for you know the nm level playing really hard end games so really good video uh, that was do you, do you remember the title of that video um i think it was something about the end game but it was like a 35 minute video and i went through first without the engine and then went back with the engine and analyzed it after um, so i think yeah. that was kind of a nice uh way to do it too i could look up the name of it Yeah, I think it was like uh, Night and Pawn Endgame, something like that. Um, but yeah, it was really cool to see Matt's thoughts kind of like as he was going through the game and trying to figure out, you know, where where he went wrong, where the advantage slipped. And he, I think you kind of figured it out, actually, without yeah, an engine. Yeah, I solved it. It took a lot of time. So it was Chess Master, Night and Pawn Endgame. But yeah, that was a really, really good one. And it's it's this same type of pawn structure. So if you want like a sample of how to play this pawn structure, uh, that could be a good video to check out. So a little bit of a tangent, but let's go back to knight f6. <laughs> anyway, knight f6. <laughs> and we're going to develop naturally here. Bishop d3, knight to c6, castle, castle, knight c3. And now I'm recommending knight to b4. And what we're trying to do here is distract this bishop on d3 before playing bishop to d7. And this is just a subtle move order uh, thing to mention. If we go knight b4 first, this bishop is most likely wanting to stay on this long diagonal, pointing at our king. It traps in the a1 rook. So even though we're kind of looking at this like dry, potentially drawish end game, like these little things add up. Um, and you need to find these little things to play for an advantage in the end game. So now we're going to play bishop to d7, and after a3 we come back, and here I'm just I'm going like five more moves, but I want to show how to play out this endgame. So this is an example: knight e5, rook c8, bishop d3, knight a5. So we're trying to kind of come in on these dark squares. We got the fork threatened on b3, and we just have this nice square on c4 as well. After rook a d1, knight c4. See how we're hitting these pawns. And this is a way that we can play actively. And then our, our goal is let's get this light square bishop in the game eventually, right? So we're going to press white on the queen side, and then eventually that bishop will come to life. We'll show two more moves, queen e2, b5. And the plan is let's get the queen side pawns rolling. Let's press over here. If we check the engine eval, it's pretty much saying dead even. But there's some kind of cool ideas where you can sometimes sack knight takes a3 win the knight on c3 so kind of keep that in mind um but yeah i recommend watching that <laughs> the video that we have on youtube with the master knight end game yeah even right here knight takes a3 is possible um but it doesn't lead to a whole lot um yeah so just definitely a tactic you want to keep in mind and actually it might be a good time to play it because i think the way white gets counterplay there is they have to attack us on the king side. And they might be so focused on the queen side that they're not looking for that. So yeah, good point, Jesse. All right, so now we looked at queen d2, we looked at g3. We're going all the way back to move four. Bishop takes d6. Um, and this is one where, I, when, I, when I was creating this course, I was like, bishop takes d6. It's just really trying to kill the whole game. Like, first they're playing the London we're already starting to fall asleep. We go with this new idea, bishop d6. Then they take d6. Like, okay, now what are we gonna do? They just wanna like play for the draw. So I came up with some ideas here and we're gonna recommend c takes d6 to create some imbalances to play with. Yep, and this is actually a really solid pawn structure. So it looks a little unnatural for new players to take with the c pawn, but uh, look at this advanced D pawn. So this is controlling these two squares, and now this uh, this pawn is completely taking away these squares. So there's no knight jumps, and we even have our own ideas of pushing these pawns up. If they take, we can take back. Not in this pos- exact position, obviously. Um, so this is like a mini little pawn triangle 
that can be very disruptive. When I played the London, I never liked, I mean, I never played this uh, move anyway, but you sometimes see these pawn structures and I was never happy when they took with the C pawn here. Um, it just, uh, it's, yeah, it's just an, a little uh, disadvantage. And I think if you're more prepared with this pawn structure, you should hopefully have good results. Um, so all that to say, E3 uh, next, and we're going to develop pretty solidly. Knight F6 and white goes c4. So this is already like a, a not so London move, like you don't see it a lot, but we have to give the, them the benefit of the doubt, benefit of the doubt that they're gonna play the best move. <laughs> yeah. So after c4, what's our plan here? So we have this kind of interesting idea, knight c6 followed by knight e7, and then we're gonna bring the bishop out this way. So chances are these two pawns are gonna trade at some point, whether we take or white takes. If they take us, we're taken with the knight. And we're gonna get that bishop into the game by getting him up to c6. And this knight's coming over here, working and head to f5 or d5. So what we're gonna to try to do is use the advantage of that d pawn being back one square to allow our pieces to use these light squares in the center, right? Get the bishop here and bring the knight over to e7. Million arrows, but yeah, that's the point. <laughs> We're going to kind of try to use that d pawn back to our advantage. So knight c6, knight c3, knight e7. Uh, defends the d pawn, so there's no threat of an isolated pawn here. If white takes, we got both knights covering it. Um, and now what we're going to do is start our plan of the light square bishop next. So let's say bishop to d3. We can take. And you know, something to keep in mind this is similar in a lot of openings. You let that bishop move once, then you take, so that it has to move twice. Like you don't just take and let him take back immediately. Bishop d6, castle, and bishop to c6. Sorry, bishop d7, castle, bishop c6. And our plan here is castle kingside, and we're going to go for this expansion. a6, b5, b4, um, and we could even consider capturing on f3 and going for sort of a minor piece imbalance, or we could play knight e to d5, trying to swap off a pair of knights. But here we have an uh, equal position that has just some slight imbalances that we can, we can play with. Yep, so we made good use of our c pawn capture, since now we have a nice solid pawn structure. And we also have a very active bishop here. So in a lot of these lines, um, our bishop kind of gets trapped in by d5 or something. So that's a nice little benefit of this line too. And with this expansion, we can kind of tuck the bishop away or even play the rook over and tuck the bishop all the way back on a8. And this is going to be a nice long-term uh, piece for us too. And uh, that's where that line ends. Um, did we have uh, yeah, another? Two, two more. So knight e5, and then uh, we'll wrap up with bishop to g5. OK. All right, so this is the fourth most popular move at the club level, and it's a small mistake. So what we're going to play here is f6. Keep in mind there's no queen h5 check immediately, so we have time to play this. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go for the e5 break again. So our opponents might not realize this when they play knight e5, but they're actually kind of helping us get ready for the e5 push by kicking this knight out. So after knight d3, we're now going to recommend knight to c6. Um, we looked at knight d7 before, and I think it's actually, okay, here we don't want to play it because there might be bishop takes d6, that's fine. So we're going to go knight c6, e3, and now e5. We get that break in, and we got it in with some tempo gained on the knight. Yeah, this is pretty much a dream scenario for uh, how we wanted this uh, e5 break to go. Um, another another good thing I wanted to say about uh, knight c6 is that we were threatening the pawn, so they needed to defend it. But now we just get the exact uh, pawn break we wanted. This, again, I'm referencing our other courses, but this kind of reminds me of our um, the exchange uh, caro con because a lot of times we go for this f6, e5 break, and those positions are really fun to play. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a, great, uh, a great pawn break here. After they take, which way do we want to take back? The uh, f pawn. Yeah. Kind of like the caro course, too. Like You build that big center with the minor pieces right behind it, that's very tough to deal with for the, for our opponents. Yeah. Uh, the only thing you really need to watch is that this pawn at this point is undefended, so we'll uh, probably defend it with the bishop in the future. 
or the or the knight, I should say. Um, so bishop needs to retreat, g3, and we're going right for it, h3. Uh, they're going to have to spend a move to save the bishop, h4, and develop knight f6. Uh, just a beautiful, harmonious development. This is what they teach in opening books. And this knight is heading to e4 next, which is going to give some problems to the g3 bishop. Our queen's kind of eyeing that pawn on h4. Mm -hmm. So knight c3. Natural move, getting in the center, kind of guarding those important squares. And here we're going to play a6. This looks slow, but it's a nice move because what white could do here after knight c3 is they could play knight b5, trying to get rid of our bishop pair, which will weaken our e-pawn. So we're taking one move to kind of block that out. And after bishop to e2, we're going to play bishop to e6. And look at this position. like. This is how you teach your kids to play chess. Like, you put the two pawns in the center, you put the knights in the center, you put the bishops in the center, and, and we're just kind of controlling all the important squares. Yeah, this is just textbook. You love to see it. And uh, just a wonderful position. It's so aesthetically pleasing to see it actually work. <laughs> yeah. White just gave us everything they wanted, and it all started with the early 95 move. So should we go a little deeper in this one? Let's go castle for white. Um, and now let's show... Uh, sample of what, what can unfold. Pawn to e4, the start of the attack. Hitting this knight on d3. The only good move is knight to f4. And now we can take one tempo to play bishop to f7. And we have a nice attack brewing. Our plan is queen to d7 and queen side castle. Now, Jesse, I already know what you're thinking. I saw you sit up in your chair. What if white takes this pawn? Knight takes d5. And it's a good question, Jesse. I'm glad you asked. Knight takes d5. <laughs> Knight takes d5. Bishop takes g3. And after white recaptures, now we can gain the piece. So there was no way to win that piece. I had Stockfish helping me there. <laughs> There's no way to win that piece. And our plan is queen to d7 and get castled. Yep. And uh, one thing I wanted to note about the timing of this e4 move. So notice how we're not playing it right here or you know we had many opportunities to play we wait until white commits to the king side and then we play e4 to really yeah to really point our pawns this way and kind of signal to our own position that we're going to be attacking here this is a very uh, common idea to wait until they commit and then we can push get, grab that extra space and use our minor pieces to launch a really solid attack um i think we got to the end of that line winning a piece so happy day <laughs> yes so now we have our final uh variation bishop to g5 so this is probably a move you'll see when someone's just like i don't know what to do with bishop to d6 they don't know if they should take move back maybe they think they're getting caught in some prep so they try to go bishop g5 throw us off a bit hit our queen um, here what we're going to do is play knight to e7 and this is not giving white the pin they want. They kind of want our knight on f6, getting that annoying pin. This leaves us options open to play f6 potentially down the line, which we like to do, followed by f6 and e5. Yeah, so knight e7 is going to be our, our recommendation. Yep, so now we have freedom with the queen here to move since this knight is defended by the bishop and we don't need to damage our pawn structure if we move away. Um, after knight e7, uh, we get the London move e3. And we are going c5, immediately uh, breaking and going off, going after white center. Um, after c3, or sorry, after c5, we see c3. And then we're going to play our favorite pawn to attack, <laughs> the, the b2 pawn, queen b6. And this is a line you're going to see, or this is a, a type of position you see pretty often, where these like uh, dueling <laughs> queens and no one wants to take the other. Yeah. Um, so queen b3, queen b6. And so here what I'm recommending, uh, there are different ways to play this, of course, but I'm recommending knight b to c6, uh, getting a developing move in. And what I'd like to look for are ways to either trap that bishop or encourage it to trade off for our knight. So after knight b to d2, I'm recommending bishop d7. Like Jesse said, neither side wants to trade queens here because it gives the other side the option of taking with the A pawn and getting some extra play down the A file. So now let's say bishop to E2. Here I'm recommending knight to G6, and that knight is guarding these important squares 
that this bishop on g5 wants to utilize. So after castle, we can play f6, and here we have a clear advantage already. So this is kind of a, a trappy way to play it, but there's definitely nothing we did here that was a poor choice. We're just giving our opponent chances to make mistakes. Um, and at this point with f6, we have a clear advantage because there's not a great place for that bishop to go without simply giving us the bishop pair. And this is where we could really have some fun. I mean, if you want, and this is what I would do, you can queenside castle and go g5 and, and start your attack over here with the bishop pair. <laughs> yeah, I'm even looking at pushing these pawns up uh, and getting that similar pawn structure with d4 and e5. Um, need, needs a little prep before we can do that, though. And this is an attack that can be effective even with the queens off the board because every other oh, yeah. piece is still on the board with that king just planted over there on g1 ready for us to pawn storm. Yeah. Yeah, another move I like here too actually is uh, bop, popping the, the queen back. And now we have this uh, little like cheapo, you know, type of threat, but we're going to provoke that weakness. Yeah, that's a nice idea too. Um, it looks like the only good move for white is d takes c, which a lot of players aren't going to know. And if they move their king, then you could queenside castle and get the same attack with the queens on the board. So yeah, that would be a nice way to play it. I like that a lot. Yeah. So that's the last line of our London chapter. How do you feel as a London player after seeing, for, former London player, after seeing all of these variations? I am so glad we're done looking at the London. Um, uh, no, but in seriousness, uh, this is a very uncommon setup that you see against the London. Normally you see players go for the early c5 break. Um, so seeing like this early queen e2, uh, if I was still a London player, I would be... Uh, yeah, a little concerned seeing this. Like, it's such a strange move. You're like, what are they cooking up? What do I got to do here? And uh, I'd probably just drop a piece. And this um, is one so... where if you're playing over the board, you just, like, you blitz those moves out from the black side. Like, oh, I know what I'm doing. E6, bishop, d 6 queen, e7. And then white's like, what? <laughs> what is this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. It's always good to get the psychological advantage on the London players. Um, uh, we're mostly joking, by the way. London is fine opening. Play it if you want. Um, at least a very solid positions. But I, I like our setup here. Um, very solid, but also gives White a lot of chance, a lot of chances to go wrong. One thing I wanted to mention, if he's watching this video, you mentioned uh, accountants playing the London. <laughs> we do have an actuary that plays the London in chess goals. <laughs> So I just kind of like that stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what an actuary is. What is that? Uh, it's like risk management. You usually have a oh, sure. advanced math degree. Uh, yeah. I see. Yeah. And kind of some similarities probably to accounting. <laughs> and he's from the UK. <laughs> All right. So that's our chapter on the London. Thanks for watching. And then the next chapter is going to be the Queen's Pawn game. And then we'll follow up with the ready, the English, and other first moves for white.